Section 15 of History of Egypt, Volume 12, by Gaston Maspero. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 2. The Memphite Empire, Part 3. The worship of Snofru was perpetuated from century to century. After the fall of the Memphite Empire it passed through periods of intermittence, during which it ceased to be observed, or was observed only in an irregular way. It reappeared under the Ptolemies for the last time before becoming extinct forever. Snofru was probably, therefore, one of the most popular kings of the good old times, but his fame, however great it may have been among the Egyptians, has been eclipsed in our eyes by that of the pharaohs who immediately followed him, Cheops, Kephren, and Mycerinus. Not that we are really better acquainted with their history. All we know of them is made up of two or three series of facts, always the same, which the contemporaneous monuments teach us concerning these rulers. Kunumu Kufi, abbreviated into Khufu, the Cheops of the Greeks, was probably the son of Snofru. He reigned twenty-three years, and successfully defended the mines of the Sinaitic Peninsula against the Bedouin. He may still be seen on the face of the rocks in the Wadi Magara sacrificing his Asiatic prisoners, now before the jackal Anubis, now before the ibis-headed thought. The gods reaped advantage from his activity and riches. He restored the temple of Hathor at Dendera, embellished that of Bubastis, built a stone sanctuary to the Isis of the Sphinx, and consecrated there gold, silver, bronze, and wooden statues of Horus, Nephthys, Selkit, Ptah, Sokhit, Osiris, Thot, and Hapis. Scores of other pharaohs had done as much or more, on whom no one bestowed a thought century after their death, and Cheops would have succumbed to the same indifference, had he not forcibly attracted the continuous attention of posterity by the immensity of his tomb. The Egyptians of the Theban period were compelled to form their opinions of the pharaohs of the Memphite dynasties in the same way as we do, less by the positive evidence of their acts than by the size and number of their monuments. They measured the magnificence of Cheops by the dimensions of his pyramid, and all nations, having followed this example, Cheops has continued to be one of the three or four names of former times which sound familiar to our ears. The hills of Giza in his time terminated in a bare, wind-swept tableland. A few solitary mastabas were scattered here and there on its surface, similar to those whose ruins still crown the hill of Dashur. The Sphinx, buried even in ancient times to its shoulders, raised its head half-way down the eastern slope, at its southern angle. Beside him the Temple of Osiris, lord of the necropolis, was fast disappearing under the sand, and still further back, old abandoned tombs honeycombed the rock. Cheops chose a site for his pyramid on the northern edge of the plateau, whence a view of the city of the White Wall, and at the same time of the holy city of Heliopolis, could be obtained. A small mound which commanded this prospect was roughly squared, and incorporated into the masonry. The rest of the site was leveled to receive the first course of stones. The pyramid, when completed, had a height of 476 feet on a base 764 feet square, but the decaying influence of time has reduced these dimensions to 450 and 730 feet, respectively. It possessed, up to the Arab conquest, its polished facing, colored by age, and so subtly jointed that one would have said that it was a single slab from top to bottom. The work of facing the pyramid began at the top. That of the point was first placed in position, then the courses were successfully covered until the bottom was reached. In the interior every device had been employed to conceal the exact position of the sarcophagus, and to discourage the excavators whom chance or persistent search might have put upon the right track. Their first difficulty would have been to discover the entrance under the limestone casing. It lay hidden, almost in the middle of the northern face, on the level of the eighteenth course, at about forty-five feet above the ground. A movable flagstone, working on a stone pivot, disguised it so effectively that no one except the priests and the custodians could have distinguished this stone from its neighbors. When it was tilted up, a yawning passage was revealed, three and a half feet in height, with a breadth of four feet. The passage is an inclined plane, extending partly through the masonry and partly through the solid rock for a distance of three hundred and eighteen feet. It passes through an unfinished chamber and ends in a cul-de-sac, fifty-nine feet further on. The blocks are so nicely adjusted, and the surface so finely polished, that the joints can be determined only with difficulty. 
The corridor which leads to the sepulchre chamber meets the roof at an angle of 120 degrees to the descending passage, and at a distance of 62 feet from the entrance. It ascends for 108 feet to a wide landing place, where it divides into two branches. One of these penetrates straight towards the centre, and terminates in a granite chamber with a high-pitched roof. This is called, but without reason, the Chamber of the Queen. The other passage continues to ascend, but its form and appearance are altered. It now becomes a gallery 148 feet long and some 28 feet high, constructed of beautiful mokatam stone. The lower courses are placed perpendicularly one on top of the other. Each of the upper courses projects above the one beneath, and the last two, which support the ceiling, are only about one foot eight inches distant from each other. The small horizontal passage which separates the upper landing from the sarcophagus chamber itself presents features imperfectly explained. It is intersected almost in the middle by a kind of depressed hall, whose walls are channeled at equal intervals on each side by four longitudinal grooves. The first of these still supports a fine flagstone of granite, which seems to hang three feet seven inches above the ground, and the three others were probably intended to receive similar slabs. The latter is a kind of rectangular granite box, with a flat roof, nineteen feet ten inches high, one foot five inches deep, and seventeen feet broad. No figures or hieroglyphs are to be seen, but merely a mutilated granite sarcophagus without a cover. Such were the precautions taken against man. The result witnessed to their efficacy, for the pyramid preserves its contents intact for more than four thousand years. But a more serious danger threatened them in the great weight of the materials above. In order to prevent the vault from being crushed under the burden of the hundred meters of limestone which surmounted it, they arranged above it five low chambers placed exactly one above the other, in order to relieve the superincumbent stress. The highest of these was protected by a pointed roof, consisting of enormous blocks made to lean against each other at the top. This ingenious device served to transfer the perpendicular thrust almost entirely to the lateral faces of the blocks. Although an earthquake has to some extent dislocated the mass of masonry, not one of the stones which encase the chamber of the king has been crushed, not one has yielded by a hair's breadth, since the day when the workmen fixed it in its place. Four barriers, in all, were thus interposed between the external world and the vault. The Great Pyramid was called Kuit, the horizon, in which Khufu had to be swallowed up, as his father the sun was engulfed every evening in the horizon of the west. It contained only the chambers of the deceased, without a word of inscription, and we should not know to whom it belonged, if the masons, during its construction, had not daubed here and there in red paint, among their private marks, the name of the king and the dates of his reign. Worship was rendered to this pharaoh in a temple constructed a little in front of the eastern side of the pyramid, but of which nothing remains but a mass of ruins. Pharaoh had no need to wait until he was mummified before he became a god. Religious rites in his honor were established on his accession, and many of the individuals who made up his court attached themselves to his double, long before his double had become disembodied. They served him faithfully during their life, to repose finally in his shadow, in the little pyramids and mastabas which clustered around him. Abdadufri, his immediate successor, we can probably say that he reigned eight years. But Kephren, the next son who succeeded to the throne, erected temples and a gigantic pyramid like his father. He placed it some three hundred and ninety-four feet to the southwest of that of Cheops, and called it Iru the Great. It is, however, smaller than its neighbor, and attains a height of only four hundred and forty-three feet, but at a distance the difference in height disappears, and many travellers have thus been led to attribute the same elevation to the two. The facing, of which about one-fourth exists from the summit downwards, is of pneumolite limestone, compact, hard, and more homogeneous than that of the courses, with rusty patches here and there due to masses of reddish lichen, but grey elsewhere, and with a low polish which, at a distance, reflects the sun's rays. Thick walls of unwrought stone enclose the monument on three sides, and there may be seen behind the west front, in an oblong enclosure, a row of stone sheds hastily constructed of limestone and Nile mud. Here the laborers employed on the works came every evening to huddle together, and the refuse of their occupation still encumbers the ruins of their dwellings, potsherds, chips of various kinds of hard stone which they had been cutting, 
granite, alabaster, diorite, fragments of statues broken in the process of sculpture, and blocks of smooth granite ready for use. The chapel commands a view of the eastern front of the pyramid, and communicated by a paved causeway with the Temple of the Sphinx, to which it must have borne a striking resemblance. The plan of it can be still clearly traced on the ground, and the rubbish cannot be disturbed without bringing to light portions of statues, vases, and tables of offerings, some of them covered with hieroglyphs, like the mace-head of white stone which belonged in its day to Kephren himself. The internal arrangements of the pyramid are of the simplest character. They consist of a granite-built passage carefully concealed in the north face, running at first at an angle of twenty-five degrees, and then horizontally, until stopped by a granite barrier at a point which indicates a change of direction, a second passage, which begins on the outside, at a distance of some yards in advance of the base of the pyramid, and proceeds at a distance of some yards in advance of the base of the pyramid, and proceeds after passing through an unfinished chamber, to rejoin the first. Finally, a chamber hollowed in the rock, but surmounted by a pointed roof of fine limestone slabs. The sarcophagus was of granite, and like that of Cheops, bore neither the name of a king nor the representation of a god. The cover was fitted so firmly to the trough that the Arabs could not succeed in detaching it when they rifled the tomb in the year 1200 of our era. They were therefore compelled to break through one of the sides with a hammer before they could reach the coffin and take from it the mummy of the pharaoh. End of section 15. Read by Professor Heather and By. For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.